think it's safe to say that nowadays the landscape in which journalists operate on is far different to the classically portrayed image in the newsrooms of yesteryear. The massive rise in social media, technological revolutions and news accessibilities means that journalists are now frequently presented with issues of ethics. When journalists do not adhere to the fundamental principles, the results can be quite catastrophic. I mean things like job loss, damage to reputation and an abundance of other things are just some of the negative consequences to a breach of morals and ethics. However, not only can your own career be destroyed, damage can be inflicted onto journalism as a whole. Consider this. Nowadays, there is less trust in the media than there has been for quite a long time. The reason why can be talked up to a million reasons, but to be put plainly, it's due to mishaps, slip-ups and general consequences of ethical breaches. But that isn't really what I want to discuss today. I want to address something that I believe depicts an extremely broad grey area in today's society. Undercover reporting. More so, how ethical undercover reporting is, if or even when it should be employed, the consideration of public interest and the use of techno technology and recording devices. So let's start at the beginning, at what our core values are when it comes to undercover reporting. Although not much is laid out in direct relation to undercover reporting in the Media Alliance Code of Ethics, Section 8 does lay out some guidelines that can be useful if you run into an ethical dilemma. It states, and I quote, Use fair, responsible and honest means to obtain material. Identify yourself and your employer before obtaining any interview for publication or for broadcast. Never exploit a person's vulnerability or ignorance of media practice. So as you can see from this, the code suggests that you should identify yourself and your employer before conducting interviews. However, obviously the premise of undercover journalism relies totally on keeping your identity unknown to interviewees. So how can we justify this? One idea that is said to justify misleading your subjects is the notion that if a story is in the public interest, it warrants the use of undercover reporting. So what is public interest? To be put simply, Public interest, in terms of ethical journalism, underscores moral authority. It approaches the idea of ethical boundaries and whether content that is being reported on is considered newsworthy or in the interest of the public enough to override ethical practices. Take the example of Indian journalist Poonam Agarwal. She was investigating the issue of corruption in the Indian Army, where high-ranking officers would ask their inferiors to perform tasks for them, such as walking their dog, polishing their shoes and other menial tasks like that. The officers were exposed to large amounts of physical and verbal abuse in the meanwhile. Basically, a garble interviewed an Indian soldier, Lance Matthew, with a hidden camera and without identifying herself as a reporter. When she published the footage and article, she blurred out his face. However, he was still able to be identified. Only six days after the footage was published, Matthews committed suicide. This case, although quite an extreme case, really does depict the ne negative effects of undercover reporting, as well as when to weigh in public interest over possible impact. It really poses the question, does exposing the unethical practices in the Indian Army outweigh and justify the means that the journalist went to to obtain the material? Was deceiving and lying to get the information necessary and of substantial public interest to justify the publication? This question's further reinforced when Matthew's suicide is considered. Does the content of the story justify the death of a real human being? Unfortunately, like many aspects of ethics, there is no definitive answer. However, the Media Alliance Code of Ethics does state within its clauses that ethical journalism requires conscientious decision-making in context. Only substantial advancement of the public interest or risk of substantial harm to people allows any standard to be overridden. This statement more just reinforces the need to justify public interest over potential harm where a story is concerned. When this is considered, I think it's reasonable to say that the content of the story does not really justify the substantial harm that was caused. Another point to be investigated is Agarwal's use of undercover recording devices. With the sudden evolution of technologies, what we are constantly seeing is the blur between public and private divide. Our mobile phones now have an abundance of filmmaking enablement, so what is stopping us from using them for the sake of a story? The Media Helping Media Organisation states that a story must be of substantial interest to the public to warrant the use of recording devices. When applied to this situation, it's safe to say that the story was definitely in the public interest. Arguably, a considerable amount of readers would wish to know about what is happening in their armies. 
and therefore this may possibly warrant the use of hidden devices. However, the subsequent consequences, such as Matthew's suicide, deception and the means of obtaining the material, nearly make this justification null and void. Overall, there are numerous theories and guidelines that must be explored before exploiting undercover journalism as a tool. Serious consideration and emphasis must be placed on public interest before authorising publication. I mean, the case of Agarwal and Matthews really underscores the need for this, and if any recommendation at all could come from this, it's to ensure that you understand the Media Alliance Code of Ethics and truly understand the value of ethics and what constitutes public interest before pursuing or even publishing a story. Thank you.